I did right down. Right back into live event form. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thank you and welcome uh, to our annual Economic Development and Infrastructure Summit presented today by uh, TD Bank. I'm Mike Skelton from the Chamber, and we're glad to, uh, to have you today and to be able to bring this program back again this year. Um, we've got a long history for this event. This is our seventh year under the uh, EDI, Economic Development and Infrastructure banner, but um, this program has a, a long history at the Chamber um, over many years previously as our Infrastructure Summit, and it's uh, always a great opportunity to come together and talk about some of the pressing, interesting, exciting economic development and infrastructure projects and issues happening in our community, in our state, in our region. Um, I really appreciate everyone's flexibility with the uh, date change that we had to make. Um, in all our years of doing uh, this event, uh, it was a first to have the reason that we had to shift our event that uh, literally every speaker on our agenda um, was impacted in some way by, the pre by President Biden's visit uh, related to specifically the bipartisan infrastructure bill that we'll be talking a lot about today. Um, so, um, you know, we've, we've moved events for weather or for venue issues or other things, but uh, never our agenda disappearing entirely. So um, I think we're actually in the long run benefiting from it. We've got a lot more information and perspective that uh, we can share on uh, the infrastructure bill, which is going to be a, a real significant uh, game changer to, uh, to our state and uh, to the infrastructure landscape across the country. A um, few introductions and uh, housekeeping uh, announcements I'd like to make. Um, today's event is uh, being recorded and uh, will be streamed by Manchester Public TV. So uh, for those that weren't able to join us, we'll be sure to share that and, and encourage you to share that uh, link around so that more folks have access to this great information and, and perspectives we share today. Want to uh, thank and recognize a few chamber board members who have joined us today. Uh, Janella McDonald from Stibler Associates, who is our vice chair. Nathan Saller from Bellwether Community Credit Union, who's our chair of our board. Uh, Ted Kitchens from Manchester Boston Regional Airport is one of our speakers today. Uh, Trini Houghton from Ripple Effect Consulting is here today. Thanks for being here, Trini. And I think Preston Hunter was gonna join us as well, but I really appreciate our board for being here, all their contributions to the chamber. Let's give them an applause and welcome them here today. Thanks to our board. Uh, wanna say a huge thanks to our sponsors who have continued to be just such great supporters and investors in the chamber uh, through the last several years and, and throughout our, our history. We're very fortunate to have great sponsors that uh, make this event and our work generally in advocacy and supporting our members possible. Our presenting sponsor today is TD Bank. Our panel sponsors are Comcast Business. Uh, our corporate sponsors are Nixon Peabody, SNHU, and Amiskeg Industries. Our advocate sponsor is Bedford Cost Segregation, Better Home and Gardens, the Mazziello Group, Convenient MD, and Harvey Construction. Uh, I want to thank TF Moran as a supporting sponsor and the Rex Theater for being our venue sponsor. Uh, thank you to Peter Ramsey and his whole team here at the Rex and the Palace Theaters for welcoming us in. This is the first time we've been able to do an event like this. Uh, in this space. It's a great economic development example in our community. And uh, this is the first time we've been able to use this screen, which is really awesome. And uh, I hope we're able to make use of it for lots of future events, a great asset to our community. So thank you to Peter and Palace and the Rex uh, for, for supporting us and be sure to come back for a show and, and see it another time. Uh, so to start, I'd like to welcome up Mayor Craig, uh, who is recently off election mode, re-election mode, and uh, uh, back to work, but lots of exciting things uh, happening on the economic development front, and would like to uh, recognize her to say a few words on behalf of the City of Manchester. Mayor Craig? I have to always move these down. 
So good afternoon. It's so great to be here with all of you today. And as Mike said, it's always great to be here at the Rex Theater. Just thinking what this was uh, prior to the partnership with MDC and the city and the Palace Theater and Peter Ramsey. Um, it's just incredible to be here and always a pleasure. So thank you for hosting us, Peter. So over the past four years, we've made progress strengthening our schools, growing our economy, and building our community. Manchester is continuing to see strong economic growth. New businesses are opening, the airport just added the first new airline in 17 years, and we're moving forward in bringing commuter rail to downtown. We've seen over $360 million in new private development, including housing, hotels, and more. We're supporting our small businesses with more than $2 million in relief programs, and we've repaired over 183 miles of roads and sidewalks and made historic investments in parks, trails, and green spaces throughout the city. And as you'll hear this afternoon, there's a lot more work in progress. Recently, the city was awarded the highly competitive RAISE grant. We applied three times, and the third time was a charm, thankfully. And with a few, just a few weeks ago, we learned that we were awarded $25 million, uh, the most that any city received in the country. Uh, this project will mitigate traffic congestion, provide increased transportation options, including biking and walking trails, and a pedestrian bridge over Granite Street, and create opportunities for development uh, throughout the area of South uh, Elm Street and South Commercial Street. We're, we're also approved, um, we also recently approved a location for a commuter rail station in downtown Manchester, which will connect the heart of our community right to Boston. Uh, plus, with the new funds coming into New Hampshire and Manchester through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, we'll see even more investments in improving connectivity, repairing infrastructure, and moving our community forward. Um, today promises to be a, a great opportunity with conversations with uh, Director Kitchens and Commissioner Sheehan, uh, who will speak in more detail about what's happening um, throughout the state and in our community. Again, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you for your passion and work uh, in our community, and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we really appreciate the, the ongoing partnership and, and support with, uh, with the City of Manchester. And um, in particular, uh, really exciting news about the uh, RAISE grant. Um, that's a, a previous topic we've uh, studied at our infrastructure committees. And I'm, I'm guessing we're going to have another presentation on that soon. Um, if you haven't seen uh, some of the details on that, I would definitely recommend you do so. Um, so with that, I'd now like to uh, welcome a, 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 we're gonna talk to Gary first. All right, perfect. Um, so one of the virtues of being in the new uh, COVID virtual hybrid event world is um, uh, rather than our participants being virtual, we have a few speakers who are gonna be joining us uh, virtually today. Um, so to start, I'd like to again thank uh, TD Bank for being our presenting sponsor today. And I'd like to welcome Gary Barr, who's the market president for TD Bank, to uh, say a few words. Gary, can you hear us? Hello? Hey, Katie. Appreciate everyone's patience. We're just hailing Gary right now.
Gary, if you can hear me, you're all good. Okay, sorry about that. All right, good afternoon. Sorry about the delay there. Uh, my name is Gary Barr. I'm the market president for TD Bank here in New Hampshire. <clears throat> Still figuring out the Zoom thing remotely, I, I guess. Um, hey, I wish I could be there with all of you in person. Um, I'm, but I'm pretty sure we have a strong showing from TD Bank, as at least I hope we do. Uh, so for today's presentation, TD Bank is delighted to partner with the Manchester Chamber. It aligns nicely with TD's own commitment to community. Now, TD is one of the larger banks in the country. We are very proud of our local roots and remain committed to our local markets. In the work for alone this past year, TD has provided nearly 700,000 grants and sponsorships, as well as countless small and tier owners. Over the last couple of years, I am particularly proud of how TD stepped up to one of the larger providers of PPP loans in the state. So, let's get on with the show. Thank you all for attending. Again, I wish I could be there. It looks like a great agenda. And if you are a TD banker, please take good notes and back over to you, Mike. Great. Thank you, Gary. And thanks again to TD Bank for, for their support. Appreciate everyone's patience as we continue to navigate Zoom world like I know we all do every day. Um, so we have one more virtual visit. Uh, I want to welcome in Congressman Pappas to say keep going. Congressman Pappas is not quite with us yet. So um, we'll talk to him a little bit later and uh, I'm sure he'll be able to uh, welcome us and uh, offer his perspective on what's been a busy few weeks, few months in Congress working on uh, the infrastructure bill. So with that, we're going to go uh, to one of our main events. Uh, Ted Kitchens is director of Manchester Boston Regional Airport in a uh, critical partner for driving economic development and transportation in our area. And we're thrilled to have him here today to offer an update on the airport and uh, key activities. There's actually a lot of exciting things right now. And uh, T Ted is the perfect speaker to, uh, to give voice to them. So um, Ted, I'm going to turn it over to you and take it away. And then we're going to have time for some Q&A and discussion uh, afterwards. So please welcome Ted Kitchens, everyone. Thank you, Mike. Is this, is this live? Okay, very good. I'm going to need to walk around to keep myself awake um, during this presentation, so help yourself to some coffee, uh, do some calisthenics. Uh, <laughs> it is, uh, but it's re it really is a delight to be here. I think this is my fourth time speaking to the summit, despite being here three years now. You got me right out of the chute um, in the first summit back in November of 18. Uh, so I was very uh, fresh and new in the job at that point, but uh, it's, it's still a delight. I count this as one of the most important presentations I give throughout the year. I always look forward uh, to being here and talking about my favorite subject, which is the airport and aviation. And the title of my presentation really sums up the entire thing. It's time to fly. Uh, it really is uh, time to return to the sky and using your local airport at Manchester Boston Regional Airport. So I like to start with the picture on the right. Um, you see my two girls there on the second row. You see my hand peeking out on the right side of the screen there. This, this photo just doesn't happen. Uh, it takes an awful lot of energy, time, effort, worry, uh, building new relationships, nurturing those relationships, restructuring our finance, building the business case for an airline to invest in our market. And then you throw in the pandemic, uh, just for good measure, right? There were days and weeks and even months where we didn't even think airlines would survive, much less add new cities. But this is a $40 million investment that Spirit Airlines is making in our community. That's how much it costs to fly one airplane to one market, or three markets, excuse me, a day for the entire year. That's, that's not the cost to run the airline that's just to fly the airplane, $40 million. Now, I know we got some bankers around here. Do you just invest $40 million because you know, I call you up and say, hey, please, pretty please, cherry on top? No, it takes a lot of effort uh, to get to this point. Um, so that is a picture on the first departure of Spirit Airlines out of the airport on October 7th, and something that we all should celebrate and support. So my agenda is going to cover four 
topics. Uh, the national, a national perspective on where we are as an industry in recovering from the pandemic. And then I'm gonna weave in a little bit of global perspective as well, because aviation is a, is a global business and obviously the pandemic is a global uh, issue. And then we wanna to switch to a little bit more of a local perspective. And then I'm gonna pause and divert a little bit into how we got this airline here, how we reinvented our business model and made the business case for that, that investment in the community. And then not to be a downer, but I think it, 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 we need to acknowledge you know, that, that challenges do remain and that they are real. Uh, in fact, one of them just appeared a few days ago. So this is a, from a, a recent study uh, from the Airports Council International uh, North America. Uh, actually, excuse me, this is the Airports Counter Council International, which is an international uh, organization that represents airport interests to uh, international uh, organizations like the Air Transport Association and Civil Aeronautics Organization. And, and it asked really, it's, it's really two surveys and combined in one, in one slide of you know, what the intent of the, past, or the survey respondent was in flying next year, which is the darker orange rust color bars, versus how many actually flew the, in the, in the uh, preceding year or uh, succeeding year, which is in that tan color line. And you can see across the globe, uh, a lot of people were saying last year, yeah, we intend to fly. But about half actually went out and flew. Uh, on the far right, you see the North American uh, percentage. 87% uh, of the respondents said they intended to fly in the next year, but only 55% did. But it gets pretty interesting when you start looking at the speed of return to travel. Okay, so this is the same survey. The left side graph is the full survey population. How many are willing to, uh, are, are looking at flying in the next zero to three months? Three to six months is the second set of columns, six to 12 months, and then beyond a year on the far right. The right-hand graph splits this into peop whether people flew during the pandemic or did not fly during the pandemic. And you can see that, uh, number one, on the left-hand graph, there's been a little bit of a softening in that demand. Uh, there, there's, we've gone from 48% to about 40% of the survey respondents saying they're gonna fly in the next three months. But there's been a corresponding increase in that six, uh, from 16 to 24% beyond a year. But when you look at whether or not you flew or not, if you flew during the pandemic, if you traveled during the pandemic, you are more than twice as likely to say that you're gonna fly in the next three, three to, uh, zero to three months than those that did not travel. And what that indicates is that people found the journey to be safe, found the journey to be secure, uh, whereas if you did not travel, you're more inclined to wait it out another year and see how uh, the, the pandemic uh, continues to unfold. So the national recovery is inverse to the number of cases. So this, this looks like a complicated graph, but the red line is the TSA throughput. If you hear uh, the media talk about the number of people checked or uh, uh, screened by TSA, that's essentially the red line, but this is on a seven day rolling average just to you know, take care of the, the daily spikes uh, that do occur. And then the, the tan line is the number of cases as reported by Johns Hopkins University. So you can see uh, there are five, five different points of interest that I found in this graph. Number one, everybody can spot the pandemic, right? Everybody kind of knows where, where we went down really quick as an industry, down 95% within a three week period. 95% of our demand disappeared in three weeks. And you can see that first wave, right? So there's a, this was new, this was scary, this was unknown, we didn't have the tools, techniques, um, or the confidence, quite honestly, to, to deal with the pandemic. But you see the second wave there and that second uh, hump in the brown line, but look how the red line didn't really change too much. It, it flattened, it was certainly blunted, uh, that it stalled the recovery that we were seeing in that uh, summertime of last year, uh, but it really didn't change the behavior too much. And I think that's because people were, again, if you go back to that ACI survey, if you flew, you found that the, the, the journey was safe and secure. You knew, we knew at that point to mask up. We knew the vaccines were coming at that point. We knew that there were some uh, techniques that were there to control the level of exposure. And then the big wave, okay? Uh, the, 
uh, there in the, the late part of last year, point number three. But you see the two little spikes in the red line. Those were associated with the holiday travel. Again, not, I mean, the, the, the third wave was you know, 25 times, 10 times bigger in terms of cases than the first wave, but you did not see the corresponding reaction by the passenger. And then we got that first significant trough. Everybody was getting vaccinated, caseloads went way down uh, there in the uh, uh, spring to summer. And look at that rebound in terms of the red line. You saw a prolonged, strong level of growth uh, starting in February on a national level and continuing all the way up until the Delta variant, which is that fourth wave that you see in the, um, in the, in the brown line. But you know, while you do see a, a, a decrease or a descending uh, level of passenger employments in the red line, I really don't think that is attributable to the Delta variant. I think some of it is, but not all of it. I think more of that was the fact that the Delta variant kind of hit during the August, September timeframe. Your leisure travel was, was uh, ending because uh, kids were going back into school. Uh, and this has been a leisure-led recovery. And that business traveler is just not there like they have been in previous years. So I think this is more of a resetting of the pent-up leisure travel that was released during the summer. It was, a, it was a relaxation of that demand as people were going back um, to school and families were not traveling as much. So uh, now you can start seeing just barely there on the right side of the graph the beginnings of the, the increase that we have seen uh, recently in cases nationwide. But you can also see that that red line is, is, is increasing. So the bottom line takeaway on this is that the, the traveler is very comfortable about traveling as long as you feel like you can mitigate your risk on the, uh, on the destination that you're traveling to. That the actual method of traveling, getting through the airport and flying on an airplane is safe. But the recovery has not uh, been uniform. There's not been an equitable uh, recovery in terms of airlines putting capacity back into different regions of the United States. This just plots uh, four key metrics that we use at the airport, and all air airline network planners use these four key metrics to uh, look at the health of a market. So the first set of columns is what we call available seat mile, which is a standard unit of capacity. I won't bore you as to exactly what that means, but it's the, it's the measurement of capacity that airports and airlines use. Uh, the revenue passenger mile is the second uh, uh, set of columns. That is a passenger, one revenue paying passenger flying one mile, that's the standard unit of revenue that airlines use. Available departing seats is the third set of columns, and then the fourth set of columns uh, is the number of onboards. Common theme, New England being the red color, we're trailing the rest of the United States quite significantly in all four metrics. And that is presenting some headwinds in our capability to attract uh, new service or expanded service uh, at, the, at the airport. The good news is if you look at the departing seats and the onboards, if you look at the, the, the New England percentage, we're filling up the seats at a pretty good rate. I mean, we're 49% back in terms of passengers, 52% uh, percent back in terms of, of uh, seats. So we're filling up the seats much better than the, than the United States average, and there's a reason why, and that's shown on the next graph. So this is by region, US DOT region of the United States. You can pick some clear winners and some clear losers. Region one, which is New England, region two, which is the Northeast, and region nine, which is the West Coast, have all not seen the return to the level of airline capacity as all the other regions in the United States. You look at region three, which is uh, the mid-Atlantic, southeast part, region five, region seven, region eight, and region 10, which is not just Alaska and Hawaii, but Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, you know, Guam, uh, those areas are seeing a lot more of a return. And that is because the consumer wants what? Wide open spaces, they want beaches, they want mountains, they want uh, uh, places like that, and the airlines are reacting to that. We certainly have that here in New England, uh, but the airlines don't see past a certain city to our south and east. As Boston goes, so goes New England. We know that's not the case, but that's how the airlines uh, do view this, this region. 
And let's, look, let's face it, Boston, New York, were significant levels of cases uh, throughout the first few waves. California on the West Coast has significant lockdowns, so the airlines have that burned in their minds as to the, that, you know, Boston was on fire. Remember, we heard those, 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 those headlines, right? I mean, that's how it was painted in the, in the media. Boston was on fire with cases. Uh, and that California was, was locked down. So uh, that is going to take some time for us to get over uh, that perception issue. So now switching locally. Uh, our demand is very consistent uh, with the national recovery. Uh, you can, again, uh, spot the, the pandemic there at point one. Uh, point two, we started growing at a pretty high rate uh, there in that summer period, actually faster than the U.S. Uh, national average, which is the brown line. But then as that second wave hit, uh, we actually uh, started seeing more people uh, not flying here uh, locally than in the nation. Uh, and then, but then starting in that February time frame, right about point three, you start seeing those lines closing. If you kind of do a line of best fit between both of those lines, those lines are actually converging. And then point five is where spirit came in. You see a significant uptick there beginning in October and November associated with the new capacity that Spirit Airlines has put in. Uh, so we're seeing a strong uptick in November. It remains to be seen if that continues into December, but I'm pretty happy with where we are right now, because all things considered. Um, we're about 25% down, so about 75, 70 to 75% back in terms of uh, activity level at the airport. So this is uh, our uh, average daily, uh, seven day average daily uh, checkpoint volume in the red versus the number of cases uh, reported in Hillsborough County, uh, again from uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and you can see, you know, kind of when that second wave hit, how our line started uh, 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 trending down, right? Uh, but in general, uh, we are, again, about that 75% uh, back uh, Pre-pandemic, we were averaging about 2,500 passengers a day through the checkpoint. And if you look at that last uh, dot on the red uh, line, we're about 2,000 passengers a day right now. So again, we're within striking distance. Uh, I think uh, with uh, a strong recovery uh, in business travel in 2022, hopefully beginning second quarter of 2022, uh, we will be able to eclipse our pre-pandemic uh, activity level. All right, so now everybody do some exercise, okay? So we're gonna kind of get, get back to how we changed our business model uh, and how we attracted uh, the uh, uh, Spirit Airlines or just even new airlines. Uh, but it, it eventually led to the uh, attraction of Spirit. And this is a smash up of two graphs. The left side of the graph, I mean, it's it split by the, the dash line in the middle, which is kind of when we did our advanced refunding of some of our debt. This, uh, the portion on the left was from a presentation that was given to me by our rates and charges analyst maybe about six weeks into my tenure at the airport. And the slide uh, to the right of that dashed line is, is from a slide that we presented to the board of mayor and aldermen showing our forecasted debt service uh, if we were to go forward with the advanced refunding. And the key here is the yellow portion of the stacked column. That is debt that is going or was going to the airlines. Before I walked in the door, the, the airlines were picking up $3 million in debt that we were not able to pay through something called the passenger facility charge. The PFC is paid by everybody who buys a ticket. It is a local source of funds, but it only goes to the airport that you use, not the airport that is nearest to you. So if you buy a ticket and you go out of Logan, that money is going to Massport. If you buy a ticket and come out of Manchester, we get the money as we were leaking demand as a community at an increasing rate, we were obviously not collecting as much passenger facility charge revenue, which was used to, de, uh, to, to, uh, to fees uh, the, the bond revenues or the bond payments. So aviation is a closed loop system. So if we have a shortfall, it goes to the airlines. This was jacking up the airline rates quite a lot. And I'll show you just how much on the next slide. But through the advanced refunding, we were able to tap into future passengers in fiscal years 33, 34, and 35 and reset the amount of debt that was hitting the airline rate base to zero. 
which then reduced the airline costs by about $3 per passenger. And that is a significant reduction. It's about a 25 to 30% reduction in their operating costs at the airport. When we showed Spirit this slide, and we showed them that they could meet their profitability, they started getting really, really interested in this market. They were just looking for a reason. And all the times that we talked to airlines before, especially airlines that are budget carriers, like JetBlue, like Allegiant, like Frontier and Spirit, this was a non-starter. Our cost structures were a non-starter. They were kind enough to listen to us, give us their time, but when they saw that number, in their mind, the conversation was over. Uh, but by showing them this and how that would reduce their costs, they were much more receptive to our, our conversation. And this is why. A lot of you in this room have heard me talk a long time about our cost per employment and how we were out of sorts with the rest of the nation. Uh, and this charts our cost per employment in the orange columns from fiscal year 2000 on the far left all the way to fiscal year 35 on the far right. The blue line is essentially if we had escalated our fiscal year 2000 um, CPE at the CPIU average for all urban areas. I didn't look at it just at the Boston Cambridge metro area, but all urban areas. And you can see somewhere in fiscal year 10 how we started growing at a much faster rate in our costs than inflation, uh, to the point where we were at $13.41, about equal to Boston and about equal to Providence. Now, the area in the red, that's just the COVID years. We're, we're going to forget about those, hopefully, at some point. But everybody's costs stay the same because, you know, bankers, you like to get paid, right? Um, employees like to get paid. A lot of these costs are fixed. But the employments were told to stay home. They were actively discouraged from traveling. So that caused everybody's costs to go up. Ours spiked at about $30.28 last year. Um, Boston's was at $80. Okay? So we went and tied. During the worst of COVID, we were about 40% below. And coming out of COVID, if we meet our passenger employment levels, our forecast and employment levels, which I think we will this year, depending on how Omicron help, uh, hurts us, but I think this year we're in very good shape to, to meet our passenger employment levels, we will be at about $8.90. Logan had to give a new official statement to their bondholders, published back in March of this year, because they're doing billions of dollars of construction down at Logan. So the bondholders wanted to have a restatement of their official statement. Their CPE for fiscal year 24 is going to be about $35. So we're going to come out of this about one third of the cost of Logan when we went in tied. That's a significant cost savings to somebody like Spirit Airlines and Frontier and Allegiant and even JetBlue. Um, so it's a very compelling story that we can tell the airlines because that is real money. Why should they pay $35 and give that to Massport when they could pay $8 and give that to Manchester and keep the $27 difference? That's real money. So going forward, if things continue, we will be below the inflationary uh, adjusted rate of our CPE. And that's the story of how we really started attracting Spirit Airlines. It's not the fun part, but it is, uh, it is a business decision. As I said at the beginning, this is a $40 million investment that this airline is making into the market. They expect $50 million in revenues off of that, off of that operating cost. So this was a completely different mentality at the airport, and we knew that if we did this, it would uh, change the conversation, and it did. With our first significant domino that fell, which was the announcement of the cargo deal uh, with Air, uh, Air Return, which is an international uh, developer of cargo facilities. They own the two cargo facilities that FedEx uh, use, uh, uses at the airport. And last time you saw those airplanes flying into the airport, they're pretty big airplanes, pretty heavy airplanes. And the number one determinant of the airline cost is what we call the landing fee, which is what we charge an airline to touch down on the uh, 
runways at the airport. So it, that's based on weight, right? It's per thousand pounds of certificated landed weight of the aircraft. So if you're FedEx or UPS and you're flying 300,000 pound airplanes versus the 100,000 airplane, 100,000 pound airplanes that American is flying in or 150,000 pound airplane that Southwest is flying in, you're paying a big bill. In fact, you're subsidizing uh, the bill for the commercial carriers. So we knew that if there's a way that we can increase the amount of cargo landings, bring in the same type of aircraft that are operating at FedEx and UPS, that would increase our landed weight, which would decrease our landing fee, which will help lower the airline costs, the commercial airline costs, even further. Um, and that's exactly what's happened. Uh, the, air, the, the cargo facility is under construction right now. It's actually demolition. Uh, we're de demolishing some old hangars uh, that are located uh, where the new hangar uh, wants to be. Uh, but this is the first new cargo development in New England in quite a while. Uh, and e-commerce is here to stay. How many of you got, got used to ordering something and having it showed up on your doorstep two days later, right? So uh, you know, e-commerce may not stay at the elevated level, uh, uh, level it has throughout the pandemic, but it's not going to go back to the way it was before. There's been a change in consumer behavior. Uh, and this will allow us to stay connected to that world of e-commerce, not only as Manchester, but as Mike and the mayor mentioned, the region. Uh, we're, we're an asset for the region. Uh, and this, this extends beyond New Hampshire. Uh, if you ever look at you know, the, the, the airfield at night, we have a lot of feeder aircraft that go up to Presque Isle, Maine, and Rutland, Vermont, and Bar Harbor. Uh, so this is, a, this is a cargo hub for not just Manchester, not just New Hampshire, but all of northern New England. And then, of course, Atlanta Spirit Airlines, uh, as we mentioned earlier. Um, four uh, destinations in Florida and one destination in Myrtle Beach. Uh, that will begin April 2020, uh, excuse me, April 20th, 2022. Say that 10 times. Uh, so all golfers, <laughs> you can get, a, you can get a, a head start on, your, on uh, getting the rust knocked off of your swing uh, that will build up over, over the wintertime. Uh, but we have daily uh, service to Orlando, daily service to Fort Lauderdale, uh, four times weekly service, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday to Fort Myers, and three-day weekly service to Tampa, Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. Uh, come Memorial Day, they'll sh they, they always shut off Tampa and Fort Myers. Um, that, that's, that's not us, that's just Tampa, Fort Myers usually does not work for Spirit in the summertime, and they'll turn on Myrtle Beach. That'll go until about Labor Day, and then they'll turn off Myrtle Beach and turn back on Tampa, Fort Myers. But I will say in my discussions with network planning, they are very pleased at how the market is responding to Tampa and Fort Myers. Uh, it's been very strong uh, reaction. Orlando's building, Fort Lauderdale, that's a surprise to a lot of us right now. We're all scratching our head as to why that is not uh, working as well as it should, particularly because out of Fort Lauderdale, you can connect to many destinations through, throughout uh, the Caribbean, Latin America, Central America, even into uh, South America. Spirit flies beyond Fort Lauderdale. It's not just about getting you to the Sunshine State, but they can take you beyond uh, the state of Florida. So doing a little bit of a Spirit 101 here, these are the type of fares that you can expect out of Manchester. Now, don't call me if you don't find that exact fare, okay? Uh, but uh, these were pulled and presented for illustrative purposes only, but I pulled this, this data back at the beginning of, of November for flights uh, in early January. I include one seat both ways. I include one bag both ways because everybody thinks, oh, they nickel and dime you. Uh, by the time you get done paying all the, all the fees and the ancillary stuff, you're at $400. No, you're at $200. Now, comparatively speaking, going to the True Blue Fair out of Boston, which is going to require you to drive and pay $40 parking versus $14 at the airport, and then drive back home. Don't forget about that, right? Uh, so you're we we'll have to add that to your, the, the fare I'm about to tell you. But the same uh, seating area, the same check bag, same dates of travel, same destinations, um, it was north of $400. And that's the true blue fare, okay? So you can almost get a two for one 
on Spirit to these destinations. And these are all nonstop, and these are not on small airplanes, these are on very big airplanes, just the same size as the Southwest uh, 737-800s, uh, about 180 seats on board each airplane. Uh, so these are, these are big airplanes. Um, so you're not having to fly on a small regional jet and connect somewhere. This is nonstop. So Spear has been a wonderful uh, corporate uh, partner and a community, community partner. At the uh, launch event, they provided a $10,000 donation to the Boys and Girls Club. And today, I called them, well, actually not today, but a few days ago, I called them and said, hey, I'm speaking in front of a very influential crowd. Anything you can do for them? Well, Corinne's got the answer. Everybody here is going to get a thousand points, uh, a voucher worth a thousand points that you can put into your free spirit account. The free spirit account is their frequent flyer program. It's a very easy program. Uh, a round trip ticket is about 5,000 points. So this is getting you about 20% of the way there. So everybody um, can, get a, can get a voucher. Only one can be um, uh, redeemed per frequent flyer account. But that doesn't mean you can't open up frequent flyer accounts for your spouse or your children like I did and take several. Because one of the cool things that Spirit allows you to do is pool the points. So up to eight adults or friends can get into a pool, you can dump all your points into it and then you can use them for travel. So thank you to Spirit Airlines for doing that. If you don't have the account, go to spirit.com. It's pretty simple to, to register. It takes you about five minutes. So some closing thoughts. Um, on the national recovery, as we talked about, it's very uneven. This is not a very equitable uh, um, recovery uh, in capacity. As we talked about, the New England Northeast and the West Coast are uh, not uh, doing very well uh, as, as compared to other, uh, other regions. The airlines learned to be nimble in regard to deploying capacity. It was, it was kind of fascinating to watch the spaghetti getting thrown on the wall particularly in places like Austin. Austin, Texas just saw so much capacity thrown in to that market. It's just not going to be sustainable. Um, uh, so it, it, it is, time will tell how it will work out. I mean, Southwest grew um, or introduced 20 new cities last year. That is 10 years worth of growth. They usually launch two new cities a year. They did 20 in one year. Okay, uh, you really want to know the dirty secret as to why that there's operational problems in Southwest? It's because of that. They just don't have the people uh, to to staff those 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 locations appropriately. Uh, we believe cash is going to be king. It's going to remain that way in the short term. Um, aviation is an extremely capital-intensive industry with very very thin margins. Um, so anything we can do, like lower our costs, uh, will help the help improve the operating margin for the carriers, and uh, we think that markets like Manchester, um, that is in a growing urban area, but also on the fringe of a major urban area, that is seeing costs go down, is going to be a, uh, an attractive uh, value proposition for airlines that are looking to grow in the region. Um, and, that, and that is the key, is are the, are the airlines, or is New England, in the airline strategy. Uh, for a long time, New England has fallen out of the Southwest strategy, which is why we're seeing reductions in Southwest capacity through all New England airports, including Boston, for a very long time. Um, but that opens up the door for somebody like Spirit Airlines to come in and say, you're not going to fly the market? Maybe I'll fly the market. So local recovery, the leisure traveler is certainly leading the recovery uh, back to 70%, but again, we don't have that business traveler back at the level that we would like it to be. The overall slow pace of demand recovery in New England is stunting our recovery. Uh, one of the metrics that we follow is what we call th uh, TSA throughput per seat. So it's how many people are going through the checkpoint divided by the total number of seats leaving the market on a day-by-day -day basis. We reached 90% which means we're 90% load factor essentially on the, on the aircraft back in April of 15, or April 15th of 2021, and we stayed that way all the way through October. Comparatively, the, air, the national level uh, peaked at 0.7. So uh, that is essentially a poor allocation of very expensive assets by the airline. So why is that? If I mentioned earlier they're being very nimble, but it's a very poor allocation of expensive assets, it's because they're following each other. There's a lot of uncertainty 
left in this pandemic. The situation is very fluid. I mean, it just changed two days ago. Uh, so there's a lot of fear right now, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of risk that the airlines are facing. And so they're kind of following each other in the sense that, okay, if you're made that decision, I'll come with you, <laughs> right? Because if they see it, maybe I'm missing something in, in my analysis. That's how, they're, that's how they're thinking right now. But there are signs of hope. Uh, the community continues to strongly support the airport. And for that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, it is a good story that we can tell the airlines. Uh, our recovery is a very good story. Uh, and I think as we get to that second quarter of 2022, if that business traveler does come back, it's going to set us up for a pretty good rebound and a pretty good uh, fiscal year 23. But as I said, I'll leave with some questions. And there are some significant questions. Will the airlines finally address the workforce shortage that's been a, a chronic issue uh, for the industry? Will they finally address it? Um, you know, the, the airlines were the recipients of billions of dollars of federal uh, loans through the PSP, as well as warrant positions. Um, so we're, as taxpayers, owners of a piece of all the airlines. Um, but where do the pilots go? Why are we having the operational issues that we're having right now? That's a question I think um, our elected representatives in D.C. may need to start thinking about asking. Will the pandemic become an endemic? Is this something that we're going to have to live with for uh, perpetuity, sort of like the flu? If that's the case, what does that do to consumer confidence and travel? I think we saw a sneak peek of that with the ACI survey, which is why I started with that one. It doesn't look good for my profession if this does become endemic. Uh, will the business traveler come back? And if so, at what levels? Uh, not all business travelers are going to come back in second quarter of 2022. Some business travel just can be done remotely now. Uh, but other types of business travel will come back. It's not a homogeneous uh, travel segment, just like there's different flavors of leisure travel, vacation, friends and family, medical travel. Coming from Houston, there were a lot of people that flew into Houston to go to the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Not the idea of a vacation for me, but that is leisure travel, right? That's not business related. If a vaccine passport becomes required for domestic travel, I forgot a word in there, it is required for international travel, but if it becomes required for domestic travel, could the industry survive a 30% shift? If 30% of the population remains unvaccinated and you require a vaccine passport, could you accept a 30% reduction in passengers and still survive? I don't know. Uh, that's going to be very difficult. I would suspect some airports uh, would probably uh, start defaulting on loans. I mean, $100 billion of secured debt is, uh, is held by airports, $100 billion. Um, that's a lot of money. What impact will the vaccine mandate have on the workforce? Um, if the mandate is, goes through, I know there's a lot of challenges right now on it, but uh, it, could they survive 10% reduction in, in pilots and crew and the ground crew and the airframe and power plant mechanics that keep the airplane safe and still fly their full schedule. In other words, can they serve all those dots on the map at the frequency that they have today? And then will oil rise over $100 per barrel? That has been a, a constant uh, threat to aviation. The last time that happened, it was not good for Manchester. It was not good for the consumer because you saw a lot of consolidation occur in the industry. Northwest disappeared. Continental disappeared. AirTran disappeared. U.S. Airways disappeared. TWA finally went Chapter 7. Uh, that was not good for the consumer. So that's thankfully going down in terms of threat. I think uh, oil was $70 a barrel this morning. Um, but I think it spiked up today, if I recall correctly. The headlines were before coming here by 3%. So we're kind of teetering on that, on that level where it starts becoming uh, not profitable for the airlines. So what can you do? So tell everybody, go out and tell all your friends, man, we can get to Fort Lauderdale for $200. <laughs> Let's go, right? Uh, the low fares are back in Manchester. We have 17 years of conditioned behavior to turn around, uh, and that's going to take everybody in this room telling your friends, your family, your uh, business compatriots, the people out on the street, <laughs> just go out there and help me get the word out there that you have low fares available to you out of Manchester for the first time in over a decade. Uh, competition between airlines is a good thing. If you like that $200 fare on Spirit, 
Because guess what? Southwest is now 200 bucks to Orlando. This summer, you couldn't get to Orlando for $200. I know, I flew my family down there, $3,000 for three people, okay? So if you like that fare, if you like that competition, it's good for all of us. We will fly Southwest and we will fly Spirit. We'll fly all of our airlines. We have four wonderful airlines here. That's one third of the number of certificated carriers flying in the United States we have here at our local airport. Not many communities our size can say that we have a 33% market share uh, of, of the airlines. Uh, we've got two global carriers in American and, and United, a low cost carrier, I say that, in Southwest, only if they have competition. If they're not, if they don't have competition, they're not gonna be a low cost carrier. And then of course, a budget carrier, very budget friendly carrier in Spirit Airlines. Get involved in the air service support and enhancement team. That is something that um, Mike in the Chamber uh, co uh, Commerce Corridor in the Chamber of, of Commerce here is leading. It's the first time that the airport has had a business consortium available to us. So when we talk to the airlines, we're bringing the voice of the business uh, community with us. Uh, so that is something that is uh, new in our toolbox. Um, so uh, if you're interested, uh, talk to Mike. Don't see me. It has to be a community-led effort, not me, um, for federal reasons. Uh, keep New Hampshire dollars in New Hampshire. As I mentioned, those, those PFC dollars, if you fly out of Logan, they're following you. Uh, at yesterday's infrastructure um, uh, press conference, I, I mentioned, and it got picked up by WMUR, that federal dollars also follow you. So you're paying, we're paying into the system, but we're not getting our fair share coming back. Um, again, we're subsidizing uh, Massport. And the time is now for everybody to fly Manchester. And I always like to end with this slide. A, it's a beautiful shot of Manchester, but we all know to shop local. We all know to eat local. We just had a small business Saturday. We're a small business. Our main street is 10,000 feet long, 150 feet wide, but it connects Manchester to the global economy. Uh, our main street is no different than, than Elm Street. It's just a little bit wider, maybe. That'd be interesting. I know, it's, I know, I know Elm Street's about two miles long, um, but fly local. Support your local airport and keep those dollars in here. The people who are working at the airport, the bartender, the waiter, the waitresses at Sam Adams are dependent on you and their families are dependent on you for their, their livelihood and uh, we need to uh, support them so that we're all lifted up. So with that, thank you. And we do have a, a small video here. Thank you, Ted. We have time for some questions. Ted, why don't you grab a seat on the far side over there? Um, I have a few questions to uh, to kick it off with you, Ted. But um, also want to invite if anyone in the audience has questions, uh, this is your this is your chance to. You have Ted under the bright lights here on the stage. Um, if you've had a flight, I'm certain not out of Manchester, but out of another airport that was delayed or canceled, you know, um, I'll save Ted from that. He may not be able to answer that, but um, this is your chance to ask the tough questions. Um, Ted, one question I wanted to ask, you, you talked about um, Spirit Airlines and how uh, big a deal that is to have a new low-cost carrier back in the airport. Um, could, could you share with the group about the economic development impact of that? Because I think that gets overlooked that um, it's always surprising to me when I hear those economic impact numbers and that flights, passengers going in and out of the airport has a, a very significant ripple down effect on the economy. Yeah, for, uh, certainly. I mean, we all like to think of air service as a way for us to get somewhere, but it's also a way for somebody somewhere else to get 
to here. Uh, those airplanes have to be filled up in both directions for an airline to really um, stick with an airport. Um, so obviously, you know, bringing those low fares to Manchester and us being able to uh, go see the world um, and to democratize air travel in a lot of ways. I mean, let's face it, you know, before, before uh, uh, Spirit, it was, you know, not very equitable access to the national air transportation system out of Manchester. Those that were very least able to afford it were the ones that were, we were asking to uh, go down to Logan. Um, so, uh, but that also allows people in those, in, in the Fort Lauderdale's and the Orlando's and the Myrtle Beaches to come up here uh, and visit us. So, you know, based on a economic input output model, uh, the, the three flights that you know, Spirit uh, introduced while it costs Spirit about $40 million to operate that, it will bring $60 million in economic impact, estimated economic impact, to the state of New Hampshire. Um, you now, back in the day, uh, during the good old days, um, we were about a $1.2 billion economic engine for the state. Um, we haven't conducted a full economic impact study of the airport recently, but uh, just the reduction in the number of passengers and controlling for inflation, we're probably somewhere around the $800 million range. So we've lost $400 million in economic impact. Um, and giving that economic, because that economic impact is occurring, it's just occurring in the Bay State, not the Granite State, uh, which is, again, another reason why we need to keep those dollars here. But if we can re re replace that with you know, $60 million in economic impact, that's the beginning, but it's not the end. Certainly it's not the end. Uh, but it, it's a big number, uh, and people don't really realize that because the concessionaires, for example, for Spirit, they, they reopened that, that Sam Adams that has long been dormant down by Gate 4. Uh, they reopened that. Well, they had to hire people, right? So now we got more people working. That may not be a problem right now with our unemployment at 3%, but hey, we have more people working. Uh, we, we're providing those opportunities um, uh, for people to find, find gainful employment and the dignity that uh, a, a paycheck you know, does provide you. Uh, so now they are able to, you know, in turn, you know, turn that money and, and turn the money through the local economy. Uh, whereas if you were going to Boston, maybe the concessionaire in Boston has to hire that extra person. Uh, or the parking lot attendants uh, maybe are being hired out of Boston versus out of Manchester. So it certainly is a, a, uh, a powerful economic engine. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to welcome up Commissioner Sheehan to talk about the recently passed infrastructure package and you know what that'll mean for New Hampshire in terms of roads and bridges and various forms of transportation. But I know you've been following that very closely, and there's a lot of impacts to the airport. So could you unpack that for us a little bit, and what do you see as being short, long-term impact for, for the airport? Yeah, I mean... That's a long, quite a long answer, Carlos. I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, to be honest, the the way that airports have been funded is is broken, in, in a lot of ways, it has been broken for a very long time. Um, there, there are two main sources of funds that uh, airports you know, rely on: the airport improvement program funding, the FAA funding that I mentioned earlier, that you know, follows the passenger and those passenger facility charges. Um, and the, again, those get doled out on. Well, the passenger facility charge goes to the airport that you use, but the AIP funds are doled out on a percentage of national employments that an airport uh, represents. Um, those, those two things have stayed the same since I was in, uh, began in the industry, you know, 22 years ago now. Um, the AIP has been $3.35 billion a year for all 4,000 airports that are eligible in the United States to go after uh, those funds. And the passenger facility charge has stayed at four dollars and fifty cents since two thousand and one. While you, inflation has taken half of that purchasing power away uh, from that four dollars and fifty cents. Um, so what has happened, as I mentioned earlier, you know, airports have had to go to the bond market, and they're holding one hundred billion dollars in notes right now. Uh, about eight and a half billion dollars a year is due in principal and interest payments. Uh, that's about you know, nine dollars per passenger flying in the in the skies. Uh, so the, the way that airports have been funded for a very long time has, has been, has, it's just fundamentally broken. Um, so the investment, um, or the infrastructure bill, uh, certainly is an investment in, you know, rectifying that, but there's still more work that needs to be done. And, you know, 25 billion is coming uh, to aviation, about uh, 20 billion to airports, 5 billion to FAA. Um, 
out of the 20 billion, 15 billion is really a modified AIP. So they're going to add that to the regular 3.35 billion. Uh, so we'll essentially see a doubling per year of the AIP funds. And then five billion is set aside into a, a competitive grant program uh, that uh, one billion of which is set aside for airports our size. So there's about 65 of us uh, throughout the United States uh, the size of Manchester. So if everybody went and filed a grant and everybody was successful every year, our fair share of that out of that for the next five years would be about another 15 million. Uh, but overall, airports you know, have $115 billion of, of development needs um, over the next five years. And AIP and PFCs may cover about 30% of that. That's how broken the system is. Uh, but again, we're very thankful for the leadership that the, both of our senators who were part of the bipartisan infrastructure framework that turned into the, into the bill, and of course, uh, both of our uh, representatives, including uh, Congressman Pappas, who sits on the TNI committee, played a critical role in getting that uh, through the House and through the Senate, so we're thankful for that. So in the, in the time we have left, and again, if there are any questions, just shoot your hand up and, um, yes, yeah, Brad in the back. Just shout it out. I'll repeat it if I can't hear you. We're hopeful of that. Back again in the good old days, uh, we would see about uh, 20 to 25 percent of our vehicles in the parking lot facilities come from the three bordering states. Um, and we, we track that on a daily basis. It's still too early to tell if there's an appreciable change in that behavior right now. But I will say over the Thanksgiving weekend, the number of Massachusetts plates that we saw in the parking garage uh, certainly uh, jumped up uh, quite, a, quite a bit. Um, where we are advertising in that northern mass, you know, the Lowell, Lawrence, Bethune, Haverhill area. We're trying not to go into 495 at Spalsman, right? And we, we don't want to dip too deep into uh, the inside of the 495 because they'll just drown us in, in marketing if, if we poke the bear too much. Uh, but those, those areas right along the border, we think that's fair game, especially if it's outside 495. And yes, go ahead. Thank you. Appreciate that. And you know, the, I, I came in new. I was an outsider, right? And uh, sometimes that can be difficult. But the team, you know, really bought into what I was saying. Um, we had some healthy debates there at the beginning, um, but you know, that that's that's to be expected. But they they bought into what um, I was I was wanting to what the vision was, and they put their shoulder to the wheel. And I wouldn't. Uh, this wouldn't be. I and mean, this is the team. This is not me, right? Um, this this is a team effort. Ted's being a little modest. He, um, he, he, is, he, he did come here from somewhere else, but he's earned the uh, nickname Mr. New Hampshire for his, as you can see, his enthusiasm that he brings to his job and uh, uh, going around the state and advocating for, for the airport. Peter, did you have a question too? Well, that's a doozy, uh, <laughs> well, but I, I, I'll tell you, b besides the when are we getting JetBlue, that's the number two question I get, um, is, is, is why, why do the buses, you know, not stop at, at the airport? And, you know, the good thing about being new is sometimes you can play the I'm the new guy card, right, or new, new girl card. Um, I really don't know the true answer to that, but I will tell you, I think it's wrong, <laughs> all right, and it needs to change. Um, uh, we, we need to figure out how to change that and at least make them or ask them to, to stop. And I'm, I'm thankful that we do have the subsidy because that gives us a little bit of control over the bus lines. 
Um, but I think we, we need to have those buses stop at the airport. I mean, they come up to Pettengill and Ray Resort Boulevard. I mean, they're, they're literally half a mile from my airport, from my front door, and they turn right. And they go around runway 35 and catch 28 to go down to uh, exit 5. And it just drives me nuts. Every time I see them, I'm, sometimes I'm back behind them and I'm just like, you know, white knuckles on the, on the steering wheel because it just, it just infuriates me that, the, that we're, we're exporting that. To answer your question about the economic uh, impact, I mean, generally the airport makes about $40 in operating revenue per, per passenger. So take the 50000 uh, times $40 and then multiply that by three because that's money that I'm not reinvesting in the community. I'm not turning. So it's, it's, a, it's a lost economic impact. Uh, you start getting to a pretty big number pretty quickly. Um, uh, so I think, you know, it, it's time to have that conversation. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. Um, I've heard, you know, a thousand different stories about why it is the way it is. And I, I'm, I'm very much the type of person that that's water underneath the bridge. I'm not going to go back and re-legislate the past. Let's just fix it and let's, let's, let's look forward uh, to going forward. I'm not much for a status quo guy, if you can't tell. Um, I'm, I really don't like the status quo sometimes. <laughs> so. Great well, question, though. Thank you. Great question. Um, we are running short on, on time, so I think we're going to transition to our, our next speaker. But I want to uh, thank Ted for, for being here today and all of his efforts. And I would just leave us with a note about um, I know on Ted's behalf and the work that he does that he is more than willing to engage with the business community as he is with, as he mentioned, Asset and a regional coalition of chambers, but your individual businesses, too. And uh, understanding what your, what your feedback is, what your needs are, um, he will use every information, piece of information he can get to bring it to the airlines. So um, part of the program today is to build that relationship and connection with you. And if you reach out to him and say, hey, I heard you at EDI and uh, I have some things to tell you, um, I know Ted will be all ears. So round of applause for Ted. Thanks for being here, Ted. Thank you, Mike. And if, if you can't tell, I do like data. <laughs> so give me numbers. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're going to transition to our uh, next speaker. I'd like now to welcome up uh, Commissioner Victoria Sheehan from the New Hampshire Department of Transportation, who, Ted, you'll be glad to know this, Commissioner Sheehan landed at Manchester Boston Regional Airport not more than two hours ago uh, and then drove right over here to be at this event. <laughs> so this is a multimodal transportation system in action right here for, for today's event. Commissioner, we have your mic for you right here. Thank you. Thanks for, for joining us. Uh, similar experience for you, Commissioner, to Ted, that I think Ted might have been on the job for a handful of weeks. I think you were how many weeks on the job before we had you come to this event for the first time? It might have been days, too. I think a too. little bit longer than Ted, actually. I think it was about six weeks, maybe. Okay. Just long enough to get my feet wet. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we really appreciate you coming back each year, and uh, it's, a, it's a great conversation. And uh, this year, I feel like, is more um, timely and important than ever because uh, you've been in the news a lot. Um, <laughs> we saw those pictures a few weeks ago of you and the delegation on the bridge in Woodstock with uh, President Biden talking about the new infrastructure deal. And um, uh, actually, I, I saw your interview with on Close Up, uh, which was a great summation and maybe some things we can uh, extrapolate on today. But to start, I wonder if you could uh, share with everyone kind of the scope and magnitude of what this bill means in terms to your current funding streams. Mm -hmm. And you previously funded through the surface transportation bill and you know this replaces that and, and really supercharges a lot of the funding streams that you've been getting over the past several years. And so I think where this particular bill is concerned, there's a lot of different feelings around how big the bill should be, what types of transportation should be funded. Um, but for us um, as an agency, this was a must-pass piece of legislation um, because the FAST Act, which was the previous surface transportation bill that funds highways and public transportation primarily, um, as well as many of our safety programs, that was expiring. Um, it actually expired in September of 2020. It was extended for one year during the pandemic period um, and so uh, we'd had a short-term extension, um, and in the past, when we've had this scenario, it's been extremely difficult for us as an agency to plan our work 
but most importantly, it causes tremendous disruption across the construction industry um, because instead of knowing what our full year's worth of funding is going to be, um, let alone our funding into the future, um, things are released uh, in one month or three month increments and um, it just it causes uh, chaos um, and a time uh, like uh, what we're facing currently coming out of the pandemic with very low unemployment, um, the construction industry and the consulting community that support us need to know with certainty what um, dollars are available and what corresponding work we're going to be advertising so they can plan and prepare accordingly. Um, so we were delighted to see a five-year bill. Um, that gives us that predictability that we're looking for. Um, so what did we actually receive in terms of additional investment? Um, so most importantly for us, they extended all of our core programs, our core roadway and bridge programs, and increased the amount of money that's being spent in those areas. It ends up being a total of about 24% of an increase over a five-year period. Um, so not all of that money comes year one. Um, we get incrementally more each year over the five-year period, but in total it's about a 24% increase. And that equates to about 224 million of additional investment. Um, and then one of the new programs that they established uh, was to address bridge conditions specifically, and so there's an additional 225 million specifically for bridges. And um, here in New Hampshire, we've been working very closely over the last several years um, as we developed our 10-year plans for transportation, um, you know, working with the Executive Council and with the legislature and the governor um, to really place an emphasis on the need to maintain the existing system before we build new. And um, so as we'd work to start updating our 10-year plan this time around, um, once again, we'd been stressing the need to maintain our bridge infrastructure, uh, do a lot of the basics in terms of roadway, paving, and such. Um, and that meant that we really were limited in terms of our capacity to meet some of the needs of communities and address these other types of investment that I'd like to see us make. Um, so now with this bridge money, we have a unique opportunity um, we can take those funds, dedicate them to some of the work that we were already planning to do, and free up the more flexible categories of funding, those dollars that can have an impact and, and be used for uh, safety improvement projects and resiliency projects and walking and biking investments, um, all the things that we've been hearing from our constituents through our public hearing process um, are really important to them. Um, one thing you touched on there uh, that I know has been a priority over a number of years has been the critical infrastructure, red list bridges. And uh, I think I heard the number that we have 118 red list bridges currently. Um, but that's been a priority, that that number's been coming down in recent years. And so what will this, this new funding do for, for a critical area like that? Uh, will we make even more headway, more headway than we have been making uh, over the past couple of years? So we've had tremendous support from the governor, the legislature, and the executive council in this area. Um, we're not an agency that's typically funded with general funds, and we rely on highway funds that come from uh, the state gas tax and from vehicle registrations. But when we've had a one-time surplus of general funds, we've actually benefited from those dollars because we've been doing the work um, of measuring the condition and forecasting performance with different levels of investment. So we could really show that there was A, a need, um, and B, that you know, we were ready uh, to put those dollars to good use. So we have seen the number of red list bridges, which is what we call structurally deficient bridges, come down over time. Um, these are bridges that are really at the end of their service life. They're safe. Um, we inspect them every six months um, to make sure that we keep them safe. But they're bridges where we're um, band-aiding and doing short-term fixes to keep them in service, and so we really want to be able to make that more lasting investment. Um, so with the additional dollars, um, we're hoping um, we'll address all of the current red list bridges, um, but based on the age of our infrastructure, there's a lot of bridges that we consider near red list, and um, they're ones that will deteriorate in the years ahead and will come onto the list. Um, so our goal is by the end of this next 10-year plan period, to have the red list number down around 80. Um, even before we got this dedicated bridge money, that was the goal. Um, but as I said, now we have this opportunity, we'll take the new bridge funds, use them for that purpose, and then the dollars that we were anticipating spending in those areas, we now have so much more flexibility in terms of how we use those. And given the size of our inventory, we're comfortable with that number of red list bridges. Being realistic, we're never gonna have a number of zero. 
Um, sometimes, you know, there's other factors that indicate when it's the appropriate time to replace or rehabilitate these structures. Um, you mentioned the 10-year plan, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a, a very important uh, policy document in the state that sets the priorities for infrastructure investments and something that our organization and lots of other organizations pay attention to and advocate for certain things on. Um, can you speak to how this bill will impact that as a, as a document? Does it allow us to accelerate certain projects um, or um, change the scope of ones that perhaps had to be dialed back because of uh, budget considerations? And I have to put one plug in for a local project, <laughs> of course. S66 and 7 on 293 is, is probably our most significant priority uh, in the 10-year plan local to us here. And uh, we'll, uh, that's already in progress and track. Will it have any impact on a project like that? So we consider the 10-year plan to be our roadmap. Um, and it really is a document that reflects the highest transportation priorities and needs in the state. Um, so our goal is to honor the, the prior 10-year plan um, process and try to accelerate all those projects that were previously identified as needs um, focus the investment in the near term in delivering those, and then as we move projects forward and do them sooner, we can backfill and add additional projects towards the end of the 10-year plan. Um, and that's really what we do, irrespective of um, the timing and, and what new funding might be available. Every 10-year plan cycle, we're trying to you know, just move things up and then add the new work towards the end of the plan. Um, so we don't anticipate adding new projects. People keep asking me, where is the list of new projects? Um, for the next five years, it's really about getting to work delivering the existing commitments sooner. Um, and you touched on an important thing. We have a lot of projects where um, you know, they were programmed maybe in 23, 24. Um, we hadn't done a lot of initial engineering work. Um, now as we're starting to think about moving those projects forward, we're realizing that things have changed. Um, there's been a lot of economic development in certain corridors. Traffic volumes are different. Um, uh, municipalities have invested in local infrastructure, and we need to provide connectivity to that. And so there are definitely projects that we have looked at in the past, um, and maybe we're anticipating doing a more limited scope and um, that we need to expand, and we'll have that opportunity now with these additional dollars to right-size projects and better meet the needs of the communities that are hosting that work. Related to that, will there be um, the GASID process where you go around and hold hearings as one opportunity for the public to, to weigh in um, and, and provide input? Will the department be undertaking additional conversations in light of this to you know, talk with communities and stakeholders about, hey, now that we have these resources, we might be able to change the scope of that project we've talked to you about in the past? Um, so every one of our projects does have a very robust public hearing process. Um, so irrespective of what scope we anticipated advancing um, or how much money um, is programmed for a project, once we go out and start working with the community, um, many times we actually delay that investment um, to allow us another 10-year plan cycle to get the support of all of our elected leaders to add additional funding if that's um, what's deemed necessary. And so... Um, you know, we, we routinely add funding and modify scopes based on what we hear um, through the public involvement. Um, in this case, we've just completed uh, 22 public hearings across the state. Um, some were both uh, hybrid as well as we had a fully virtual hearing. And we have a lot of that feedback now from communities. And um, as happens every 10-year plan cycle, there's a lot of project needs out there that um, weren't necessarily accommodated in the initial draft. Um, but people have to remember, we actually already programmed um, this 24% increase in funding. And the timing of things was such, the Senate passed the IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, back in the summertime. Um, and then the bill sat before the House could reach agreement um, on the path forward. And there was you know, that desire to try and tie the infrastructure bill to the reconciliation package. Um, so we've known for quite some time uh, what we might get in terms of additional investment. We wanted to be somewhat conservative, so we hadn't programmed like the new bridge money as an example, but we had programmed the 24%. Um, so we're making modifications now, but we're not adding $500 million worth of work to the plan. We're adding the $225 million. Um, and so we've been meeting with each of the councillors one-on-one, because um, we're in the first phase of the 10-year plan development. That's when we work with the executive council as GASET, 
um, the Governor's Advisory Committee on Intermodal Transportation. Um, and so we'll uh, be then finalizing um, their version of the 10-year plan, which will go to the Governor for his consideration and then go to the legislature. Where there'll be more opportunity for public input is when we get into the House and Senate phases. So the 10-year plan becomes a bill, it becomes a piece of legislation. And so like any bill in New Hampshire, there will be a public hearing and the department will have countless workshops with um, the Public Works and Highways Committee and then with the Senate Transportation Committee to make sure that our legislative officials understand what's in the plan and what it means for the state. So I have uh, several more questions to get to, but I also <laughs> want to invite, if there's questions from the audience again, just shoot your hand up, flag me down, and we'd love to uh, get your input in questions as well. Um, Commissioner, I have recalled from uh, several past summits, you talked about your workforce challenges mm -hmm. as an agency, both with um, you know, your New Hampshire DOT employees and many of them reaching retirement age, um, but you also referenced in your comments the consultants in, in private sector mm -hmm. resources that you rely on to, to complete this work. Everyone's impacted right now by, by workforce challenges, so are you gonna be able to you know, is that going to inhibit some of this progress? And is that, is that a real concern? So we definitely have workforce uh, challenges and workforce concerns. Um, Ted talked about some of the other things that um, in the aeronautics world they're focused on. You know, the, the rising cost of gas um, directly impacts the price of asphalt and the cost of doing business for us as a department. There's also a number of supply chain issues um, you know, contractors have been having to lock in pricing very early um, to be able to guarantee uh, receipt of those materials and goods. And so um, there's a lot to work through. Um, you know, Governor Sununu is very focused on um, getting industry together so we can talk about how to best tackle all of these challenges. Um, and we're also looking to the Biden administration um, to do some work in this space as well. In the IIJA, there is funding available for workforce development um, and for certain types of initiatives that we are eager to hear more about. Um, and really, it's going to take a strong partnership with the private sector. Um, we as a department are not successful without uh, the support of um, not just consultants and contractors, but everybody who supports our industry. And so talking about exactly what this bill means for New Hampshire um, and how much work we're going to be able to deliver you know, in the next 12 months versus over the entire five-year period um, so everyone can plan appropriately. Um, you know, that's what we're focused on now is starting those conversations, getting everyone together. Um, and you know, I've, I think I've spoken five times this week about what the IIJA means for New Hampshire, including today. So um, we're eager to get to work, but it's going to be challenging, um, especially in the next 12 to 18 months as we get started. Um, so I wanted to ask you about a topic that I know you get asked about every <laughs> summit here in Manchester uh, is rail, mm -hmm. an important topic for our community for southern New Hampshire. Um, so maybe an update on uh, New Hampshire DOT continues to work on the Capital Corridor project, mm -hmm. the project development phase, and where, where that stands. And uh, does this infrastructure bill impact that in any way, um, directly or indirectly? and perhaps speak to, you know, uh, I guess an indirect impact is there is separately funding for Amtrak, and yes. Amtrak has identified the Northeast and specifically the New Hampshire area as a potential expansion area, so um, that's different than what New Hampshire DOT is proposing, but is possibly another option that could come before the state is. Uh, so we conducted the feasibility study around the Capital Corridor Rail Project. What came out of that study as the preferred alternative was a commuter rail service to Manchester. That seemed to be the most viable. Um, and for that reason, um, when the legislature asked the department to move forward with the Capital Corridor, uh, we ended up using Federal Transit Administration dollars, um, FTA funds, to do what's called the project development phase of that project. So people oftentimes call it a study, um, but it's not. And what we are doing right now is uh, finalizing the design. We'd actually be ready to go to construction when we complete this phase of the project. Um, revisiting all the environmental permitting, um, and most importantly, developing a financial plan um, and identifying ways that we could pay for both the construction as well as the ongoing operating expenses. Um, and so that is a, fe a federal transit agency funded initiative. 
um, which was included in the last 10-year plan. Most recently, um, for those of you that have been following that project and have gone to some of the meetings, um, you'll know that we've been working to refine the station locations and where we would site the layover facility. Um, those are key elements of this project because without knowing the specific location, um, it was hard to estimate accurately those construction costs. So with some of those decisions now um, being made in the weeks and months ahead, we'll be able to start to uh, truly advance the final design. Um, and then the difficult conversation about how we pay for this uh, really begins. And so people have asked uh, several times now, you know, what does this new transportation bill mean? Um, so there is no funding specifically for New Hampshire for the Capital Corridor Rail Project. Um, what there is, is an increase in our Federal Transit Administration allocation. Um, so for all public transportation, um, from our local bus services um, to uh, the funding that we receive for the urbanized areas, we're seeing about a 30% increase. And so certainly, that increase could help support a commuter rail service into the future. Um, but most importantly, you know, I ran through some of the numbers of what we're getting um, through formula as a state. There is a lot of grant opportunities in this bill. Um, it's actually a little overwhelming. There's going to be numerous grants uh, for different types of projects. Um, I think the biggest challenge for USDOT is going to be standing up all of those grant programs, identifying the criteria, putting out the notices of funding opportunity, um, scoring all of the applications, um, but there'll be several opportunities to apply for grants um, to advance construction of a project like the Capital Corridor should we as a state decide we want to move forward. Um, people keep talking about the Amtrak idea. Um, so Amtrak has identified the Capital Corridor in New Hampshire as a potential location for them to expand their footprint. Um, they've talked about an intercity rail connection up to Concord. Um, I think the challenge for us and the business community in New Hampshire is intercity service would not have the frequency to necessarily meet the expectations of the business community. Um, we have in the past you know, favored advancing this project as a commuter rail project, which would be um, a lot more trains running per day, a lot more activity around the stations. Um, and given that we'd have to come up with a way to pay for the operating of this service, I mean, we've really been looking at transit-oriented development um, and that increase in business activity being necessary to help contribute to the operation of the service. Um, and so, you know, certainly if, if we crunch the numbers and we cannot find a way to make a commuter rail service viable, then intercity might be something that we want to look at. Um, so we continue to engage with Amtrak. We want to make sure that we're paying attention uh, to what they're doing and not missing out on that opportunity. But the way that we're funded, um, and like I said, because of what came out of the feasibility study originally, you know, we're focused on commuter service first and foremost um, until we get further along and we know whether that truly can move forward. Yes, Mark, go ahead. Um, so as part of that project, we have to upgrade the track um, to meet passenger standards. Um, so uh, one of the good things about this project is it's not um, a, a greenfield project. We actually have an existing corridor, so the environmental permitting is l much less challenging than if we were building a brand new rail line. Um, but yes, everything has to be brought up to higher standards for passenger service. Um, it's very different than the freight standards. Uh, but we aren't necessarily looking at high-speed rail because we're looking at commuter rail. So where the capital corridor is concerned, the MBTA already has the operating rights for passenger rail on that corridor. Um, so irrespective of who owns the underlying railroad, um, should we choose to move forward with this project and operate a commuter rail line, then the MBTA has the rights today. And that's why, um, as we start to now estimate the cost of operating the system, we're um, beginning to engage the MBTA and MassDOT um, to make sure we understand um, you know, what it's truly going to take to support the operations. Um, because that ongoing cost uh, that we're 
the most focused on when it comes to finding sustainable sources of revenue um, to make this actually a reality. Um, so there was a conversation about the bus service um, earlier. Uh, yes, the, the goal would be to have a station um, in technically being Bedford, but immediately adjacent to the airport um, with a shuttle service that would take you over to the terminal. Um, that's currently what's envisioned. So Commissioner, maybe to uh, big picture on this rail discussion, which has been ongoing in our community for a long time, <laughs> it sounds like uh, that one of the overall impacts of this recent legislation and these grant programs is, you know, we've known at some point once the project development phase is complete, your job, and the Hampshire DOT is to present options to policymakers as to how a project like the Capital Quarter could advance. So this has potentially added more tools, more solutions, more ways to advance or fund the project. Um, because ultimately, I think for policymakers, that's really where the decision has will be and has mm -hmm. been, is, is the debate has been, is how do you fund any ongoing operating expenses? So is that fair that you think these grant programs have that potential to change the potential options we might have had to present that financial plan? I think when it comes to funding the construction, um, there's a lot more opportunities than perhaps there, there previously was, um, especially if we ended up doing an Amtrak option because they would pay a lot of those upfront construction costs. Um, the operating is the more challenging piece um, because that requires ongoing formula funding um, and so we'll be um, looking at that very closely and a lot of the analysis that we've been doing with our consulting team is around how um, other projects across the country have been advanced and what sources of revenue were established to help pay for the operating expenses and this idea of transit oriented development um, and really generating as much activity around the stations um, is something that we think is probably the most viable uh, way to, to try and offset um, the operating costs. Uh, but we really have to crunch the numbers and see what that looks like. So the first piece was identify where the stations are going to be and then look at the existing land use around those locations and what the potential is and, and how we could establish maybe TIF districts and things of that type that would um, mean that we had pledged revenues to help pay for the operating. Um, we have time for a few more questions, so welcome if anyone else has uh, questions. Um, I did want to touch on something we haven't uh, got to yet that um, was, uh, I guess, a, a specialty priority in the, the infrastructure bill, which is electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. The state has gotten some money uh, for that, and I think we've all noticed that there's a lot more electric vehicles on the road each, each, each day. It seems like you, you see more and more. So what, what is the impact there? What do you see that? What role? The play in, in kind of, uh, facilitating those funds. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and um, building resiliency into our infrastructure uh, throughout the IIJA. Um, and so there are two uh, programs around EV charging. Um, one is a formula program. So New Hampshire will receive approximately 17 million over the five-year period um, in dedicated funding for the installation of EV charging um, units. And we'll be working with other state agencies, um, Department of Environmental Services, um, as well as Business and Economic Affairs to talk about uh, how we can build upon some of the work that was done. There was actually an EV charging uh, commission um, that the legislature had established. So there's been a lot of work already done in that area. And then there's another discretionary grant program. Um, so we'll also be able to apply and compete for dollars um, should we decide that we want to invest beyond that 17 million. Um, so we're, again, trying to learn more about how those programs would be administered. Um, but it is um, something new for us to have dedicated federal funds. And one of the changes you'll see as we update the 10-year plan now that we have the signed bill is we'll be adding that in as a program um, with the three point something million that we'll get each year for the five years. Yes, sir. Um, so one of the challenges I think we all have um, as we talk about funding for transportation is 
you know, how do we come up with a new way to sustain these investments into the future, given that people are driving more fuel-efficient vehicles, as well as the fact that um, there's now these incentives um, and car manufacturers announcing that they want to move towards um, fully electric fleet um, in the not-so-distant future anymore. And um, so Congress did not tackle this issue. Um, when uh, state DOTs and our association had been advocating for a five-year bill, and we kept trying to draw attention to this need to, to also work on the long-term solution for um, the declining uh, federal gas tax revenue. Um, because I think there's many states are hesitant to move to a new model or a new system, um, especially if it has a high cost of collection, um, if we don't know how the federal government is going to transition to something different. Um, so there's been a lot of studies across the country on road user, uh, road user charges. Um, uh, Representative Norm Major here in New Hampshire, the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, had proposed um, basically a, a registration surcharge that would um, be a sliding scale where you basically would pay the di difference between what you previously paid in, in gas tax versus what you're paying today if you drive a hybrid or electric vehicle um, or a vehicle that's significantly more fuel efficient. Um, so we're a little disappointed that Congress hasn't really <laughs> found um, a way to move forward aggressively with a new solution uh, because, like I said, you know, I empathize with state legislatures across the country. Um, they don't want to move to something new if the federal government was to go in a totally different direction. Um, but we are very concerned about, um, you know, our, we are not living within our means. Uh, the Highway Trust Fund for many transportation bills now has been bailed out with general fund transfers. Um, and so, you know, we're somewhat revenue agnostic in the transportation business. We're making the case that we need to invest. You know, our infrastructure is critical to our economy. It's critical to quality of life. Um, it's up to our lawmakers as to how they want to pay for it. Um, and up until now, they've chosen to use general funds to subsidize the revenue, the old revenue streams. Um, so with the deficit rising, you know, we think they still need to find a more sustainable way to pay for transportation into the future. Maybe to wrap up, Commissioner, we could uh, build off that and ask about um, looking ahead to this upcoming legislative session. Mm -hmm. um, what issues are, are are you monitoring or uh, potentially working on? I think you mentioned that the ten-year uh, highway plan will, will be um, as it as it uh, gets passed from the executive council <laughs> to uh, the legislature be a priority. Um, but there have been bills that have looked at this issue of some sort of new surcharge that captures revenue from uh, electric vehicles and, and any other po major policy issues that you see at the state legislature this year that would be of interest to the, the business community? Well, I've talked a lot today about what this additional investment in infrastructure means for transportation specifically. Um, but a lot of the other investments that are being made, whether it's in water infrastructure, in broadband, um, you know, both through the the new bill, um, but also with all of the COVID relief money that we had and the American Rescue Plan dollars, there's been support for investments in those areas. And we as DOT own a lot of right-of-way, and there's a lot of utilities within that right-of-way, so we're going to play a role um, in reviewing and helping to advance those projects as well. Um, so we're not just focused on the transportation infrastructure, we are following closely what the legislature um, and the governor's office are recommending in terms of investments in all of the categories of infrastructure. Um, and so when we talk about the workforce and staffing up, it's not just to deliver our own projects, it's to make sure that we um, aren't a roadblock or a barrier to the other agencies who are going to be working to deliver um, you know, these large-scale investments, uh, you know, broadband um, and water infrastructure. The need is significant, um, I think, especially in the broadband area, going through the pandemic and seeing how people struggled with just lack of access. Um, we all want to get those dollars flowing as quickly as we can. Um, so there's a lot for us to follow in terms of the work of the legislature. Commissioner, I really appreciate you joining us today. I know this has been a very, very, very busy uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and you're, you're busy in general, <laughs> but this is at a new layer to that. And especially uh, appreciate you adding this uh, uh, 
layover under your flight <laughs> into uh, Manchester today. So a uh, round of applause for Commissioner Sheen. Thank you. Well, I was happy to be here, and I had no hiccups with my travel. I, as well, usual, smooth flight and uh, easy transfer coming through Manchester. So thank you, Ted. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner. So with folks, we're going to uh, start to uh, wrap up our event, or I'm getting a signal that, yeah, we're good. Um, so we're going to wrap up our event. Congressman Pappas did send his regrets um, that he sent us a video. Perfect. Okay, I have to work on my sign language for, <laughs> for next time. Uh, so Congressman Pappas did send his regrets on not being able to be with us live, but had a message he wanted to uh, send us. So we'll pause for that and then wrap up. Thank you so much for inviting me today to join the Infrastructure Summit. I regret that we had some technical issues earlier and that I had some votes um, here. I would have uh, much preferred to be with you live, but hope the session is going well and also hope that everyone had a great Thanksgiving and is looking forward to a, ho a good holiday season. Um, thanks to Mike Skelton and the members of the Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce for putting on this event and for all you do to advocate for business interests in Manchester. Now look, as we approach the end of the year, there are always a number of critical things that are on the table here in Washington. A few of the issues that we're working hard on right now are funding the government and keeping the doors open and avoiding a shutdown, uh, as well as ensuring that we're protecting the full faith and credit of the United States by extending the debt limit. So those are two issues where we're working to find bipartisan consensus. It's frustrating that it's not as easy as it should be, um, but we're gonna keep moving forward because we know our economy depends on it. Um, I'm also really proud that we were recently able to see the bipartisan infrastructure bill passed in the House and signed into law. Uh, it was just a couple weeks ago now that President Biden joined us in Woodstock, New Hampshire, uh, up north on this old bridge. In fact, as we walked across it, it's a 1930s vintage bridge. Uh, you could look down at the river below and really see the corrosion. Uh, we have hundreds of bridges in New Hampshire that are in need of repair. And the good news is, um, from this particular piece of legislation, uh, and I've been involved in this fight for a number of years as a member of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Uh, but the good news about the bipartisan bill is that we're going to see uh, an increased investment coming here to New Hampshire. Um, for our formula funding, as well as for bridge work, that's going to mean about a 47% increase in the amount of federal dollars that are going to be able to be invested on our highways, our roads, and our bridges. So that is some significant positive news. Um, also included in this bill is a significant investment in broadband. We know how essential that is for our small businesses and for our households right now, and we know that far too many don't have the connections that they need to participate in uh, commerce and in telemedicine and education and all sorts of other services that are, on that are online. So this bill will deliver more than $100 million to New Hampshire, will help close that gap that comes on top of uh, infrastructure money that we pass as part of the American Rescue Plan uh, so those two bills will go a long way toward closing that gap here in New Hampshire. I'm sure Mayor Craig also mentioned a significant investment in wastewater and water infrastructure. We hope that will help support the needs of cities like Manchester that we know have aging systems and have to spend a great deal of money on making upgrades to keep things safe, uh, to support future growth, and to protect the environment. Uh, and this bill on, on both of those fronts will uh, reauthorize the state revolving funds and increase the amount of investment that's coming here to New Hampshire. Um, so, you know, I think as we move forward, uh, we've got to look at ways that we can connect our economy to investment in infrastructure. And I'm pleased that, um, you know, this session here today helps do that. Uh, and in Manchester, there's some really significant ways we can do that. Uh, you know, if you look back through our history, in the 19th century, we were a leader in terms of industry. Our infrastructure was big brick mill buildings and canals and steam engines that powered Manchester. Uh, we know for the 21st century, that looks a lot different. Um, it's high-speed broadband, it's an upgraded electric grid, it's water infrastructure that will meet our needs. It's certainly highways and roads, but it's also uh, pedestrian paths and bike infrastructure. Uh, that's why I'm really excited about uh, the announcement that there's some additional money coming to Manchester beyond the bipartisan bill uh, in the form of this RAISE grant that the mayor and her team have worked 
very tirelessly on and really pleased to see that $25 million award. That's really going to help, help remake the South Elm Street area, um, improve connections, improve interconnectivity between different modes of transportation. That's going to be a big boost to the Queen City. Um, you know, we also are looking down the road at the creation of a multimodal transportation hub. Uh, there's money in the bipartisan bill that's going to go to support uh, the development of new rail service, so the programmatic funding is there in the bill and is flexible for New Hampshire to chart a path forward. Uh, I'm sure Commissioner Sheehan talked a little bit about um, the state's work on this in terms of um, you know, developing the financial plan, uh, doing the preliminary design. Uh, that's obviously going to take a, a local, state, and federal partnership to get it off the ground. But we know there are great benefits uh, in terms of increasing economic activity, creating jobs, uh, and supporting a bright future for Manchester if we can get that project done. So I'll just close by saying this. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, I think this is some terrific progress on infrastructure, but obviously we have to work to see it through. Uh, it's a multi-year bill. Uh, it's a five-year bill. And so we're going to be partnering closely with our state officials, including Commissioner Sheehan, to make sure that New Hampshire is taking full advantage of the benefits that are in the bill. A bit beyond infrastructure, I just want to say, you know, thanks for all that you do to advocate for our small businesses. It has been an incredibly difficult 19 months. The pandemic clearly turned business as usual upside down. Uh, but I think what it showed is that small business in New Hampshire is strong, it's resilient, it's innovative and creative, uh, and you all really helped to write the book on how to survive and thrive in unprecedented and challenging times. Uh, I know that running a business at its best times is incredibly hard, and so I don't need to tell you all as well um, you know, what you've all been through the last 19 months. Uh, and how challenging things continue to be. But please know that our office stands ready uh, to help assist any way we can. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out if we can be a resource. We have a, an office right on Elm Street, corner of Elm and Hanover in Manchester. Uh, so please get in touch if there's anything we can do uh, for your company or anyone else in the Queen City. Uh, that's what the, we're there for ultimately. So thank you all for putting together this session. Hope to join you in person in the future uh, at some point to talk further about the benefits uh, to infrastructure in New Hampshire through this piece of legislation. Uh, and everyone stay safe and have a happy holiday season. Thank you all so much. As well as our uh, COVID protocols and uh, doing our best to keep everyone safe in the holiday season. I um, want to thank uh, Ted and uh, Mayor Craig and Congressman Pappas for their participation today, as well as all of our sponsors. segregation, better homes and lighting. Facility today, it's been a lot of fun to, to be here. So thank you all again for being here. Have a great day. Have a safe and happy holiday season. We hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everyone.